In 1771, in Scotland, David Hume was born. Scotch Presbyterianism is the worst form of religion that has ever been produced. The Scotch Kirk had all the faults of the Church of Rome without a redeeming feature. The Church hated music, despised painting, abhorred statuary, and held architecture in contempt. Anything touched with humanity, with the weakness of love, with the dimple of joy, was detested by the Scotch Kirk. God was to be feared. God was infinitely practical. No nonsense about God. They used to preach four times a day. They preached on Friday before the Sunday upon which they partook of the sacrament, and then on Saturday, four sermons on Sunday, and two or three on Monday to sober up on. They were bigoted and heartless. One case will illustrate. In the beginning of this 19th century, a boy 17 years of age was indicted at Edinburgh for blasphemy. He had given it as his opinion that Moses had learned magic in Egypt and had fooled the Jews. They proved that on two or three occasions, when he was real cold, he jocularly remarked that he wished he was in hell so that he could warm up. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to be hanged. He recanted. He even wrote that he believed the whole business, and that he just said it for pure devilment. It made no difference. They hung him, and his bruised and bleeding corpse was denied to his own mother, who came and besought them to let her take her boy home. That was Scotch Presbyterianism. If the devil had been let loose in Scotland, he would have improved that country at that time. David Hume was one of the few Scotchmen who was not owned by the church. He had the courage to examine things for himself and to give his conclusion to the world. His life was unstained by an unjust act. He did not, like Abraham, turn a woman from his door with his child in her arms. He did not, like King David, murder a man that he might steal his wife. He didn't believe in Scotch Presbyterianism. I don't see how any good man ever did. Just think of going to the Day of Judgment, if there is one, and standing up before God and admitting without a blush that you have lived and died a Scotch Presbyterian. I would expect the next sentence would be, Depart ye cursed in everlasting fire. Hume took the ground that a miracle could not be used as evidence until you had proved the miracle. Of course, that excited the church. Why? Because they could not prove one of them. How are you going to prove a miracle? Who saw it? And who would know a devil if he did see him? Hume insisted that at the bottom of all good is something useful, that after all, human happiness was the great object, end, and aim of life, that virtue was not a termagant with sunken cheeks and frightful eyes, but was the most beautiful thing in the world, and would strew your path with flowers from the cradle to the grave. When he died, they gave an account of how he had suffered. They knew that the horrors of death would fall upon him, and that God would get his revenge. But his attending physician said that his death was the most serene and most perfectly tranquil of any he had ever seen. Adam Smith said he was as near perfect as the frailty incident to humanity would allow human being to be. The next is Benedict Spinoza, a Jew, born in Amsterdam in 1768. He studied theology and asked the rabbis too many questions and talked too much about what he called reason. And finally he was excommunicated from the synagogue and became an outcast at the age of 24 without friends. Cursed anathematized, bearing upon his forehead the mark of Cain, he undertook to solve the problem of the universe. To him the universe was one, the infinite embraced the all. That all was God. 
He was right. The universe is all there is. And if God does not exist in the universe, he exists nowhere. The idea of putting some little Jewish Jehovah outside the universe, as if to say that from an eternity of idleness, he woke up one morning and thought he would make something. The propositions of Spinoza are as luminous as the stars, and his demonstrations, each one of them, is a Gibraltar, behind which logic sits laughing at all the sophistries of theological thought. In every relation of life he was just, true, gentle, patient, loving, affectionate. He died in 1812. In his life of 44 years, he had climbed to the very highest alpine of human thought. He was a great and splendid man, an intellectual hero, one of the benefactors, one of the titans of our race. And now I will say a few words about our infidels. We had three, to say the least of them, Hayne, Franklin, and Jefferson. In their day, the colonies were filled with superstition, and the Puritans with the spirit of persecution. Law, savage, ignorant, and malignant, had been passed in every colony for the purpose of destroying intellectual liberty. Manly freedom was unknown. The Toleration Act of Maryland tolerated only chickens, not thinkers, not investigators. It tolerated faith, not brains. The charity of Roger Williams was not extended to one who denied the Bible. Let me show you how we have advanced. Suppose you took every man and woman out of the penitentiary in New England and shipped them to a new country where man before had never trod, and told them to make a government, and constitution, and a code of laws for themselves. I say tonight that they would make a better constitution and a better code of laws than any that were made in any of the original thirteen colonies of the United States. Not that they are better men, not that they are more honest, but that they have got more sense. They have been touched with the dawn of the eternal day of liberty that will finally come to this world. They would have more respect for others' rights than they had at that time. But the churches were jealous of each other, and we got a constitution without religion in it from the mutual jealousies of the church and from the genius of men like Paine, Franklin, and Jefferson. We are indebted to them for a constitution without a God in it. They knew that if you put God in there, an infinite God, there wouldn't be any room for the people. Our fathers retired Jehovah from politics. Our fathers, under the directions and leadership of those infidels, said all power comes from the consent of the governed. George Washington wanted to establish a church by law in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson prevented it. Under the guarantee of liberty of conscience which was given, our legislation has improved, and it will not be many years before all laws touching liberty of conscience, except it may be in the state of Delaware, will be blotted out. And when that time comes, we or our children may thank the infidels of 1776. The church never pretended that Franklin died in fear. Franklin wrote no books against the Bible. He thought it useless to cast the pearls of thought before the swine of his generation. Jefferson was a statesman. He was the author of the Declaration of Independence, founder of a university, father of a political body, president of the United States, a statesman, and a philosopher. He was too powerful for the churches of his day. 